I guess the, the Ford Motor Company really fits the definition of the American dream. Um, since it started out with the vision of a, a son of an Irish famine immigrant from Ballinascarty, is that how we say it? In County Cork, to the leading uh, company putting the world on wheels basically in the 21st century. When the auto industry, and you all know this, but it, it's no harm to say it again, because when the auto industry was on, on the brink of destruction, the Ford family didn't wait for a government bailout, but they borrowed 23.6 billion putting up most of its assets, including the Blue Oval, as collateral. So it was a pretty awesome decision by the family to make. <laughs> and it proved to be a good one. This past October, Ford announced its 10th profitable quarter. It reached an agreement with its union workers and is in the process of uh, creating 12,000 American jobs in the next three, three years. William Clay Ford, or, or Bill, as I can call him now since I sat beside him at lunch, is the great-grandson of Henry Ford. And he joined the Ford team in 1979 as a product analyst. He's not just here because of the success of Ford Motor Company. He's here because of family and because of his connections to his Irish roots, which is pretty amazing. So uh, I'd like to welcome... Bill Ford. With that introduction, I should just shut up and sit down because that, that was that was very nice. Well, thank you, thank you all for having me, and it's it's really a huge honor to be inducted into the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, to to join such distinguished people as Bill Clinton, uh, Maureen O'Hara, and uh, James Watson, the Nobel Prize winner, is really uh, quite humbling. Um, and for a guy from Detroit who runs a family business, that's a pretty impressive company to to be in. And it's also really cool to be part of the uh, Business 100, and I'd like to congratulate everybody who's part of that. Um, it is, it's an amazing list. And actually, you know, our Ford's Irish roots are well represented because not only am, am I there, Alan Mulally, our CEO, is, is part of it, and Jim Farley, our chief uh, marketing officer, is part of it. So we're, we're well represented at Ford. Um, well, we all came here today uh, because a powerful force that connects us to one another, and that's the pride we have in our, our Irish heritage. Um, and it also provides insight and inspiration to help us address the challenges of the future. So I'd like to say a few words about the importance of honoring our heritage, as well as the necessity of moving forward uh, boldly. And frankly, that's been a guiding principle of ours at Ford. We honor our past, but we don't dwell in it. We build on it. Uh, and knowing where we came from helps guide us uh, towards where we're going. I've always been really proud of my Irish heritage. And so this last summer, I had a really uh, awesome time because I took my family uh, back to Ireland. And I particularly wanted my kids to be able to, to understand their Irish uh, uh, heritage and to explore it a little bit. So we did go to, well, we actually went all over the country, but we did stop in Bolinascarty, which is where the family farm uh, still is. Um, and um, as you all heard, my uh, great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, William Ford, uh, came over on the famine ship in 1847. And he did end up in Quebec, uh, as most of the ships did. And then there was a big Irish community in Dearborn, Michigan. And some of the people who had preceded him over um, uh, drew him there. And so they settled on a farm in Dearborn. And that's where, uh, in 1863, uh, my great-grandfather, Henry Ford, was born. So when we were uh, over in Ireland this summer, um, we went to the town. And, and it's kind of neat. In the town square, there's a uh, life-size uh, uh, stainless steel Model T commemorating the, uh, the, the connection between Henry Ford and, and the town. And we had a ceremony around the Model T, which was pretty neat. I mean, a lot of the town people came out. In fact, there aren't that many of them, but, uh, <laughs> but whoever was there did come out. And, um, but then what was really neat was we got to have, we went and had lunch at our uh, relative's uh, farmhouse. And uh, so the Ford family clan is, is still there. Um, and the, the people, as you would all suspect and, and expect, were, were absolutely fabulous. And we spent the day sort of exploring the Irish genealogy of Ford and it learned some interesting things, one of which was that Ford itself had an E at the end, typically. And we think it was dropped uh, maybe by William Ford when he came over, which got me to thinking, I wonder what the Blue Oval would have looked like with an E at the end. Uh, 
But um, anyway, uh, it, was, it was really, it was very, very fun, particularly for my children. And when I was there, I actually did some work along the way. And so I went and visited uh, our offices in Cork and met with all the employees. And then I had a, uh, met with the, the four dealers there as well, um, who were, as you might suspect, going through a tough period. I mean, the, you know, with all the, the, uh, the economic challenges, auto sales are literally about half of where they were several years ago. But our dealers are actually doing quite well, and, and Ford is, is doing well in Ireland. Um, one of the other things that's interesting, uh, Ireland's the only place where the Ford Motor Company isn't officially the Ford Motor Company. It's actually called Henry Ford and & Son. And the reason for that is after uh, Henry came over to, to visit Ireland, he wanted to open a Model T facility in Cork. And his board of directors said, no chance. Um, you know, we've got other priorities. We don't have the money. No. So he took his own money uh, and built the Model T plant, but he couldn't call it Ford Motor Company, so he called it Henry Ford and & Son. And so to this day, uh, Ford's name in Ireland is legally still Henry Ford and Son. Um, he was a very fascinating individual, uh, and many of his innovations, such as the Model T, the assembly line, and the $5 a day wage were familiar to us because in many ways they helped change the world. But to me, his most fundamental innovation was his belief that the function of business was to serve society. And this was in a time of robber barons and exploitation. And he believed that the main purpose of a corporation should be to serve customers, employees, and communities. And he fought with his partners to build a car that would enhance the lives of the average person and not just the most affluent. He insisted on reinvesting profits into building a better, less expensive product and then sharing those profits with his employees. And in fact, it's interesting, he was thrown out of almost all the business groups he was part of for, for having profit sharing, and he was branded a socialist uh, and was told he was never welcome on Wall Street. And that was kind of fine with him. So, um, <laughs> But he also said, there's a most intimate connection between decency and good business. The only foundation of real business is service. So that wasn't the conventional, conventional wisdom of the day. But I'm convinced it's the reason why he was able to build a great enterprise and put the world on wheels. And at Ford Motor Company, we continue to follow, follow the values of our founder today. And my vision is to build great products, a strong business, and a better world. And we remain a family company to this day. But we also think of our employees as extended members of our family. And that's just not rhetoric. We have so many people in our company, they're second, third, fourth, and even fifth generation employees working there. Uh, and it really, I think, makes us a special company. And so this family feeling and family involvement, I think, differentiates us from a lot of big corporations. We're not a nameless, faceless co company. And our name is on all our products. And I believe that gives us a strong sense of commitment and responsibility. And the stability and long-term perspective of our family provides a key element of the success of our company. And as Patricia said, five years ago, we anticipated that a, a, a downturn was about to happen, although there's no chance we could have anticipated how bad it was really going to be, and that we, didn't, we clearly did not know the credit markets were just going to freeze up completely. So I, I went to the banks uh, and borrowed as much as we possibly could uh, so that we could keep investing in new products. And we did, we, hocked, we mortgaged everything, including the, the, the Blue Oval. And you can imagine what our family discussion was like when I had to tell all my relatives that uh, I just uh, mortgaged everything, including the family name, to keep us going. But, um, but they were great. They were great, and they understood it, and, and they agreed to it. So when, when the worst hit in 2008, we were ready. Um, and during the recession, sales plummeted to the lowest level in 25 years. Um, and uh, we made it through, as, as you know. And we were able to keep investing in a complete line of fuel-efficient vehicles. And that great, gave us a great head start on the sales and profit growth that we're achieving today. And I kind of like to think that it's uh, our combative Irish, Irish heritage that got us through the, the tough times. Um, so if I could just say a few words about the present day and kind of what we're looking at at the company, and this really is not going to be a company speech, but we're, at the inter we're at sort of at the intersection, I believe, of three critical global issues, the economy, energy, and the environment. 
and there are concerns about employment, the availability and affordability of fuel, and impact of CO2 on the climate. The demand for energy efficient environmentally products is growing and will continue to grow. And smart companies have been racing to get ahead of this trend to create green products and green jobs. And at Ford, we placed a huge bet back in the darkest days uh, of 2006, 2007, and 8. And we said, we want to be the fuel economy leader in every single segment that, you, that we participate in. And for us, that was a huge departure, because the one thing we were not known for was fuel economy. So we started in investing billions in research uh, and, uh, and development to, uh, to power this fuel efficient uh, uh, drive that we were on. And so uh, while many of our competitors cut back during the lean years, we actually kept investing in R&D and, and doubled down on a lot of our product bets. And because of that, we now have a dozen vehicles that are best in class and four models that get at least 40 miles per gallon. And we just began rolling out our new electric focuses, all electric, and next year we're going to produce our first plug-in uh, vehicle. But we're also investing in something that isn't getting a lot of uh, airtime today, uh, and it's really, I think, the next generation of, of technology, uh, and that is intelligent vehicles. Vehicles that can communicate with each other and also communicate with the infrastructure around it. So it can make vehicles much safer, much more uh, uh, easy. You could be able to find parking spots without driving around your vehicle, find it for you. It'll be able to gather data from everywhere and then guide you very quickly to where you want to go. And I, I think you know, this isn't sort of some science fiction stuff. You're going to see these on the, ve uh, on the road within the next five years. We have a concept vehicle out now called Evos, which is really cool because it's connected to the cloud. And basically what, e what it can do is it can route you around traffic jams, uh, anticipate bad weather, and if it anticipates bad weather, it'll immediately change your suspension to whatever weather is coming up. Um, it can monitor your health, including your blood sugar, your blood pressure, <laughs> everything else. <laughs> Um, it, can even, uh, it can even turn down the temperature and turn off the lights in your house as you pull away from your garage. And, and this, is, this is all ready for prime time. It's really quite remarkable. Um, so, you know, we're pushing hard on this, uh, and I think it's going to be a really interesting and, uh, and, and very useful technology and help make people's lives better. Um, and in fact, uh, some of the research we've done with government agencies think that crashes could be reduced by 80 percent with this technology. Um, and importantly, though, it's also going to help us uh, deal with traffic congestion, which is becoming a huge issue. Uh, because if you just do the math, uh, today there are about a billion vehicles on the road. By mid-century, that's going to be between three and four billion. So where are they going to go? How are they going to operate? And, you know, and so I think this smart technology is going to really help um, and, you know, we, we see it probably less here, although in New York certainly it's an issue. But when I say here, here in America, but if you go to Asia, they're living it right now. They had an 11-day traffic jam in China last summer. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So we, knew, we do need new technology, but the interesting thing is I, it's coming, and it's going to be, I think it's really going to be very liberating. But because it, so in the process, though, we're becoming a very high-tech industry. And prior to the recession, I think most people dismissed the auto industry as old-fashioned or even irrelevant. And really, the, you know, most of America admired people who made deals, not people who made things. Um, and the auto industry was, was viewed by many, I think, as a, sort of a Rust Belt dinosaur. Um, and I'm happy to say that I really think that's, that's changing. And I think if anything good came out of the downturn that we just had nationally, it was a, sort of an increased national recognition that industry does matter. And in fact, there hasn't been a strong economy anywhere since the Industrial Revolution that wasn't built on the back of, of strong industry. And so, uh, you know, it's my hope and actually it's my belief that in this country we're waking up to that fact and starting to value what we have and wanting to build upon it. Um, but we are becoming very high tech and it's really, it's, it's interesting what's the technology that's going into vehicles, but it's also industry, the young people that we're attracting into our, our companies who want to work on that kind of technology. Um, but we've been able to do this by following the principles of, of, of our founder. And it's important to note that we haven't idolized the past at the expense of the present. If we had, we'd still be building Model Ts and not electric focuses. And if we over, over idolize our past, we can stifle progress. 
But it's important, though, to still be guided by the principles that we hold dear. And our goal is to help people have a better life. But to do that, we do, we, we're have, having to use the latest in technology. It's an exciting time for our industry and for our company and for me personally. I cannot wait to get to work every day to get going on this really interesting stuff. So anyway, um, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, recognition today. It's, it's incredibly meaningful to me. And, you know, as I was talking to my children about it last night, I mean, they, it was really amazing. I, I knew that they loved their trip to Ireland. I wasn't quite sure how much of it, you know, would stay with them. Um, but not only do they want to come back next summer, which actually I think we're going to do, but um, uh, they were really blown away by this, this, this recognition. And so um, it means a lot to me. It means a lot to my family. And, um, and so i just like you to, as we think about it, remember your heritage with pride and be mindful of all the experiences of our forebears um, and use those to guide our companies uh, as, we, as we go into the future. So thank you so much, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to every one of you. Thank you. Thanks.